You know, generally I consider Twitter to be nothing more than a festering cesspool of hatred, envy, virtue signalling, and pointless life-sucking arguments between people that never have and probably never will meet each other in the real worlds. But every so often, you stumble across little grains of truth and pearls of wisdom, one of which happened this morning while I was taking a shit in my neighbour's garden. Wait, what? Anyway, this one took the form of a lengthy Twitter thread describing a growing trend amongst major movie studios of intentionally provoking and antagonising fan bases in order to gain attention and deflect criticism from what they've made, a practice known as fan baiting. The OP described it thusly. Fan baiting is a form of marketing used by producers, film studios and actors with the intent of exciting artificial controversy, garnering publicity and explaining away the negative reviews of a new and often highly anticipated product. It's something a lot of us in the world of film criticism have suspected for some time now and it neatly explains a lot of the seemingly baffling decisions that drive modern movie production. Ever wondered why studios, directors and actors make such a point of hyping up the diversity diversity of the film's cast rather than the film itself? Ever wondered why it's become common practice to race and gender swap popular legacy characters rather than create interesting new ones that are purpose built? Ever wondered why the release of any major production is almost always accompanied by a storm of shill media articles endlessly prattling on about how important the latest piece of generic corporate trash is for whatever social political cause happens to be popular right now and dismissing any dissenting voices as toxic hateful bigots? Well, wonder no longer, dear viewer, because basically it all comes down to fan baiting. And since it's all been brought into very sharp focus by the controversy swirling around rings of power over the past few months, I figured this might be an interesting topic for us to explore together. So strap in, because the drinker's taking you on another instalment of Why Modern Movies Suck. It all began in the year of our lord, 2016, with the release of the rebooted Ghostbusters movie. Now, you don't need me to tell you that this film was a failure in basically every aspect of its production, from the tedious and derivative plot to the unfunny jokes, hammy performances and cringe-inducing dance scenes. Paul Feig just wants to dance, you guys! But none of this seemed to matter at the time because according to the news media, the only thing that anyone cared about was the gender of the four main characters. They certainly didn't hate the movie because it was poorly written, horribly acted and shoddily produced by a creative team that either lacked the motivation or the intellectual capacity to understand the source material. Oh no, they just couldn't stand to see four women taking a man's place on the big screen. Don't question this any further, it's just pure sexism, take our word for it. And somehow, through some combination of Lovecraftian manipulation and absolute stupidity, the studio even managed to get the movie embroiled in the US presidential election. You gotta be fucking kidding. That's right, seeing Ghostbusters 2016 became an actual political act. <laughs> <laughs> because if you didn't support the female Ghostbusters, then clearly you didn't support the female presidential candidate either. And that could only mean you were voting for the orange man. Leslie Jones became another big focal point of the media war around this movie. It's no secret that her character Patty didn't exactly endear herself to fans. She was loud, annoying and obnoxious, and Jones's overbearing performance didn't exactly help the situation. Get out of my friend, ghost! There were plenty of legit reasons to criticise both the character and the actor, none of which had anything to do with the colour of her skin, but naturally the media chose to focus in on the small minority of racist assholes who did exactly that. So guess what the narrative became? Racist toxic fans harass black actress. Any legit criticisms of the character or her performance immediately went out the window and the only thing people saw was that all important emotionally manipulative headline. Conveniently forgetting the fact that nobody had a problem with Ernie Hudson's Winston three decades earlier. Truly, there was no ploy or gambit, no matter how dirty or desperate, that they wouldn't try to use to sell this movie. But as it turned out, all the underhanded tactics in the world couldn't 
didn't make Ghostbusters a hit, but what it did do was set the fan baiting ball rolling and pretty soon this shit became standard practice within the industry. Not just an uncomfortable reality of a hyper polarised marketplace, but an accepted part of a project's marketing strategy. And truly, one of the biggest offenders has got to be Disney. They're practically falling over themselves to antagonise their own fans these days and farm the resulting controversy for everything it's worth. You thought Rose Tico was a badly written character who added nothing to The Last Jedi and actually took away from pre-existing characters like Finn? Shut up you bigot, you're no different from the people who chased Kelly Marie Tran off social media. You thought Captain Marvel was kind of bland and unlikable, with no compelling struggle or conflict and powers that basically make her an invincible god that nobody could challenge? Clearly you just hate women. You thought The Eternals was a boring, incoherent mess with no idea what it was trying to say or be, made by an inexperienced director that was completely out of her depth? You need to silence those disgusting thoughts because this film is literally saving lives. You thought the Mulan remake undermined the original's inspiring message about the value of hard work, determination and resilience in favour of the lazy, meaningless and potentially harmful platitude that being female makes you automatically brilliant at everything? God, you're such a toxic hater. Damn man, it's even gotten to the point where they wheel out these excuses and thinly veiled provocations before the product even gets released. Like Tim Miller with Terminator Dark Fate, who proudly proclaimed the androgynous thing <laughs> Sorry, old habits die hard. Grace would be an awesome character for enlightened individuals, but would scare the crap out of basement dwelling misogynists. <laughs> oh no, Tim, please stop. The implication was as subtle as a purple unicorn with a chainsaw super glued to its forehead. If you didn't like this character, and by extension the film she was in, then clearly you're the problem. Or how about Moses Ingram from Obi Wan Kenobi, who was apparently briefed in advance by Lucasfilm that she'd be getting racist hate from toxic fans, almost like they were counting on it happening. I mean, I'm not for a moment suggesting that studios would create sock puppet accounts on social media to false flag harass their own actors and drum up controversy to help defend their shitty products or anything, but wouldn't you know it, some convenient cherry picked examples were soon produced out of the tens of thousands of social media interactions she probably gets, thus negating any actual criticism of the character, the writing or the show at large. How's that Little Mermaid trailer working out for you, Disney? <laughs> But it's not just Disney that have got into the fan baiting game, it was the same deal with the new Resident Evil show on Netflix, which turns out to be an absolutely laughable disaster with almost nothing to do with its source material. But what did all the promotion and media articles focus on before its release? The fact that the showrunners took an iconic antagonist known for his blonde swept back hair and sunglasses and recast him with a black actor. The intention was clear, they were trying to bait the fan base into reacting to such a bizarre change so they could cry racism and ignore actual criticism of the turd that they'd produced. And let's not bullshit each other here, this kind of guilt by association crap has an impact, not just on public perception but on professional critics as well. People whose theoretical job it is to assess the strengths and weaknesses of a new piece of media fairly, without bias or undue influence, so they can give the general public a reasonable sense of whether a new project is worth watching. Because really, who wants to be lumped in with all those toxic bigots that dare to criticise a movie for having a diverse cast? Who wants to be ostracised from their peers, losing that all important access to premieres and set visits and tainted with an accusation that they can never quite escape for the rest of their careers. Ever wondered why critic and audience scores look like they're reviewing completely different movies these days? It's because it's easier to take the safe option and praise the things you're expected to praise rather than risk voicing your true opinions. I mean really, do you think Black Panther would have been lavished with such wild borderline hysterical praise if it had been set in Northern Europe and starring an all white cast? The the sad reality is that controversy creates attention. Which brings me at last to what may be the ultimate example of fan baiting, the Rings of Power. Right from the start, the atmosphere around this show was pretty contentious. After years of terrible reboots, remakes and modern reinterpretations of classic franchises, nobody was particularly optimistic about Amazon buying up the rights to one of the most beloved fantasy stories of all time. Would they stay true to the lore or change it to suit their needs? Would they honour the spirit of Tolkien's work or twist it and remake it to reflect the world we live in today? The answers came soon enough with the first batch of promotional images, which made 
made sure to feature race-swapped elves, dwarves and hobbits in centre stage that were never part of Tolkien's world, and female political leaders and sorcerers turned into sword-swinging girl-boss soldiers. They were practically daring the fans to challenge them, and when they inevitably did, the first batch of hit piece show media articles surfaced. Pretty soon, this one topic became the focal point for the show's entire marketing campaign. Actors, writers and producers spent more time trying to defend and justify their casting choices rather than talking about the show itself. Sophia Nomvet somehow became the spokesman for the entire cast, banging on endlessly about how playing a dwarf with a different skin colour from other dwarves we've seen until now is some kind of glass ceiling shattering event that puts her up there with Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. This represents progression. This represents an acknowledgement of where we have been and um, a will to get to where we need to be in order for this to be accessible to everyone. Fucking calm down, love. You're not saving the world here. The image they desperately wanted to convey is a band of brave, noble artists under siege by braying hordes of toxic, hateful fans, conveniently ignoring the fact that they're the ones who created the monster they're now fighting. They chose to go against the source material they claim to have such reverence for, knowing that it would piss people off but doing it anyway. They chose to shout those changes from the rooftops, rubbing it in the faces of the actual fan base who they'd already pissed off. They chose to turn their show into some kind of cultural flashpoint in the hopes that it would deflect attention and criticism away from what they'd actually produced. Like I've said before in a previous video, diverse casting is without doubt a good thing in principle, giving people from different backgrounds, cultures, races and genders a chance to be represented on screen is the fair and right thing for any studio to do. But it doesn't mean it can be done in every single project, regardless of the setting and context, because the reality is that sometimes it just doesn't fit no matter how hard you try to bend reality around you. If I made a movie about pre-colonial Native Americans and randomly sprinkled some white actors into the tribe with no explanation, then people would have every right to question that creative choice. It wouldn't make them bigoted or racist, it would just make them normal, rational human beings who know that what I'm showing them doesn't match up with reality. And trying to paint them as such would make me seem like a total asshole trying to dodge criticism. It's the same shitty tactics that go all the way back to Ghostbusters 2016, just more advanced and better organised now. But it results in the same depressing outcome. Actual fans get so burned and pissed off with the treatment of their franchise that they go into it with the worst possible outlook, determined to find problems and unwilling to even give it a fair chance. Yeah, it might garner you some short-term sympathy from a general public that doesn't get to see the full picture, and some fake positive reviews from critics scared of being lumped in with the enemies of the state, but in the long term, nothing good comes out of this stuff. With less honest criticism focused on the actual artistic quality of the work, there's less incentive for writers and showrunners to push themselves to produce better content. It creates a deceptively positive feedback loop where they hear nothing but good things from the professional sources they trust, and conveniently dismiss any criticism as invalid and motivated purely by personal bias. And if you want an example of the overall quality of movies and TV shows being adversely affected, well, look at what we've produced over the past five or six years. It's also pretty shit for the actors, who for the most part are just honest people looking for their big break. They're not likely to turn down career-defining roles, even if it means playing characters that they might not be suited to. But ultimately, they're just being used as both weapons and shields by giant studios in a never-ending war against their own fans, and along the way, they're probably going to get exposed to a lot of abuse that they don't deserve. I guess what I'm trying to say with all of this is that the best way you can generate hype for your movie or TV show is to just focus on making the best content that you possibly can, telling the best story with the best writing and performances that everyone involved can deliver. There's plenty of options for working in actors of different genders or ethnic backgrounds, even in a place like Middle Earth, but simply dropping them randomly into cultural cultures and locations that make no sense and offering no explanation beyond we have to reflect the world we live in today isn't the way to do it. And lastly, trying to dismiss any and all criticism, regardless of the context or intent behind it, as hateful and toxic bigotry is at best disingenuous and at worst fucking detrimental to the success of your own products. Whether you love them or hate them, the fans are the people ultimately writing your paychecks, and your success is tied to their appreciation of your work. You can fight them, you can ridicule them, you can provoke them, but the one thing you can't do is ignore them. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.